In Runeterra, there are many world-ending threats. A Relian soul who wants to snap Runeterra out of existence after what the aspects of Targon did to him. With the only thing stopping him being a crown that keeps him away from Runeterra, which is slowly weakening. The world runes which caused the rune wars where people used said world runes which were basically nukes on each other and wiped whole places, populations, and historical records off the map. The Darken who are currently trapped in weapons, but should they ever unite will surely end the world. The Ruination from the Shadow Isles, Fiddlesticks the Horror, Mordkaiser in the Afterlife, and many more. But no threat to Runeterra as as large, or horrifying, as the Void. And the threat of the Void on Runeterra, and truly all of existence, can be traced back to one single character, Lysandra. Lysandra's lore overall is crazy. It goes from fighting demigods, to ripping the souls from an entire race of yetis, to taking children from their villages to be raised as warriors. But to truly understand Lysandra, and how she doomed all of Runeterra, we need to go back. Far back. In the beginning. Before the existence of time, space, or reality, there was only the nothingness of the void. A vast emptiness that acted as the home to entities without form or sentience, known later as the Watchers. However, this silent nothingness was disrupted by the sudden appearance of reality, and in the first breath of creation, the celestial dragon, Aurelian Soul, was born. Aurelian Soul began populating the empty space around him by forging stars, and other aspects also came to be in existence. Yet. This radiance stirred the ancient and ominous Watchers. Roused by the dawn of reality, these eldritch entities had been slumbering in the silence of nothingness. Now awakened, they grow ever more annoyed with the newly formed reality that interrupted their non-existence. However, they are unable to cross into reality to destroy this light and return to their slumber. Moving into reality ourselves, the planet Runeterra is taking shape orbiting a fairly unremarkable star created by Aurelian soul eons earlier. Zooming into Runeterra, at approximately 8,000 years before the founding of Noxus, we see a volatile and dangerous age in the Freljord, where demigods reign supreme. During this time, Lysandra and her sisters, Cyrilda and Avarosa, were born. A little about the demigods, there are four that are most prominent, although there are more, the last of which is pretty weird. Anivia, who represents the eternal cycle of life, death, and rebirth, intrinsically associated with the changing seasons. Volibear, who is the storm made manifest, and represents the unstoppable power and fury of the Freljord itself. Orn, demigod of forging and craftsmanship. And finally, the Seal Sister, worshipped for her guidance and protection from the harsh waters of the Freljord. The Seal Sister may be one you've never heard of, and that's not even her real name since it was forgotten. She really doesn't show up in Lysandra's story, and has only ever appeared as a side character to some other Runeterra champions. Supposedly, she helps Orn build Hearthmoon, his forge, by cooling it with the ocean's waters. And the ocean wind is so cold, sailors rub blubber on their faces and think about the Seal Sister to protect them from the icy ocean winds. Is it the blubber rubbing or the Seal Sister? Is the blubber a requirement to communicate with the Seal Sister? We don't know, but we know it works. So rub the blubber and think of the godly seal sister, people of the Freljord. Speaking of Orn, around this time, humans seeking to honor Orn established a town on the mountainside of Hearthholm. This industrious group, later revered as the Hearthblood, strove to achieve Orn's lofty standards of perfection through their masterful creations. On the other side of the Freljord, Anivia sees kindness in the creatures known as the Yetis and grants them the Heart of the Blue also known as the Heart of Anivia. This transforms the Yetis into magical beings and allows them to make true ice. True ice is a magical ice that could only be created by the Yeti and the magic given to them by Anivia, a very rare mineral. It is so cold, it can never be melted. If you want to know more about these demigods, I recommend my video on the Lost Tales of Orn, or play Song of Nunu which heavily features Orn, Anivia, and Volibear. Back to Lysandra. In a time long forgotten, a dangerous and volatile age before the sands birthed and then swallowed Shurima, when beings of old magic freely walked Runeterra, and the borders between the mortal realm and what lay beyond it were hotly contested. 
It was during this time that Lysandra and her sisters, Cyrilda and Avarosa, were born. And even at this time, a twisted darkness existed beneath the world. Now I'd like to note some portions from the story, The Lost Tales of Orns, where the three sisters seek out Orn for help to save the world from this darkness. However, do note that this story is a story from the people of the Freljord, and has been passed down from generation to generation. So we don't know how accurate it is, although I assume the main points are. The three sisters wanted to ask Orn for help to deal with this darkness. Orn, however, did not care to help anyone save any world, anywhere. It was for personal reasons, and he did not elaborate on the matter. But this did not stop the three sisters from journeying many days and nights to ask. The first sister, Cyrilda, tells Orn that there are creatures of great and wicked magic who stalk their tribes and want to destroy the world, asking Orn if he will fight with them. Orn grunted. This grunt meant no, in such a way as to halt any more discussion. This was understood by all, and if you had heard this grunt, you would have thought the first sister wise to not press the matter further. The second sister, Avarosa, told Orn that the beings were watching their every move. She asks Orn to use his spade to dig a mighty trench, which they will lure the monsters into themselves and solve their own problem. Orn does agree, as he was planning on digging a hole anyways, and the place suggested was a fine spot. This hole is known today as the Howling Abyss, a bottomless crevasse carved into a glacier. That is one deep hole, said Everosa. I pray it is deep enough. Wind blew up from the freshly dug abyss with an otherworldly howl, as if to say that it was deep enough. If you would have heard the abyss howl, you would have thought it wise that no one climbed down to measure its depth. Several years later, the sisters returned. They looked as if the battles with their foes had taken a toll. This time, the third sister, Lysandra, spoke. She asked him to build a bridge across the howling abyss stating that the other bridge builders cannot build a bridge with the type of stone they have. She then presented a chunk of star metal. If you had seen the star metal, you would think it wise that only Orn could possibly ever shape this material, for it was almost as stubborn and unyielding as him. Orn agreed, but he would do the work alone and required the star metal itself as payment. Lysandra gave it to him, and he used it to forge a tool to help build the bridge. With that tool, and only that tool, Orn built the bridge. Avarosa felt bad about the third sister's lie, for they did not need a bridge at all. She asked Orn what sort of tool it was. Orn had used the tool to hammer, and so he called it Hammer. When he was out of sight, the third sister, Lysandra, walked the length of the bridge, reciting strange incantations across the entire span. This turned the bridge into a crossbar that sealed the beast below within the abyss. However, the addition of magic ruined the quality of his work. The enchantment would slowly eat away at the masonry. It would take ages though, so nobody paid it much mind. Sometime after this, Lysandra, Cyrilda, and Avarosa each sought to harness the powers at war, and each paid a terrible price. Attempting to command the heavens above them, Cyrilda lost her voice to the first twilight. Avarosa faced the twisted dark beneath the world and was deafened by its emptiness, waiting to consume all creation. As the sisters sought power, they soon gained the notice of the demigods, who could not agree on how to proceed. A few, like Anivia, seemed inclined to work with the sisters, while the Vully Bear and the Iron Boar wanted to destroy them. Others would have been content to ignore them completely, since these feeble creatures would eventually die like all before them. But the Vully Bear would not wait and looked to the most animalistic and savage of his followers, known as the Ursine. With them, he would defeat the Three Sisters. The Ursine, or the Lost Ones, dwell in the northmost part of the Freljord, entirely consisted of warrior shamans known as Spirit Walkers. The Ursine are human shapeshifters who serve the great spirit of the bear known as Volibear. Volibear's servants are entirely devoted to their master's will and cause. While some retain their human appearance, most permanently shapeshift into grotesque approximations of wild animals and other types of monsters. The Ursine are called the Lost Ones 
because of how they have lost their sense of self to the Voli Bear's influence. The tribe has existed for as long as humans settled the Fraul, ever feared and respected by the land's inhabitants. In preparation for the battle with the three sisters, Voli Bear gathered the air sign and sought out Orn to arm his warriors for battle, but Orn refused. He did not approve the Ursine's savage ways, and a terrible fight erupted between the two demigods. In the aftermath, the Hearthblood, living on the side of Hearthholm, were destroyed, and Volibear cursed his brother's name, casting off his rune-inscribed armor. He would fight from then on with just tooth and claw and might and thunder. Far from being lessened, the Volibear found his full power was now unleashed. With newfound rage, he confronted one of the mortal sisters, Lysandra, who sought to steal the power of the demigods for herself. And before her entire army, he struck her down, blinding her. With her sight taken, Lysandra chose instead to walk in dreams. As she navigated the fitful visions of those around her, she realized only she could see the darkness below for what it was. The lingering abyss promised not only an ending, but infinity. It was death, both dangerous and full of potential. Unknown to her sisters, Lysandra struck a deal on their behalf with the godlike entities she had communed with. The Watchers would grant them near mortality in exchange for preparing Runeterra for the coming of the Void. The three sisters and their most powerful followers were granted power which gave them resistance to the cold and granted the ability to manipulate both true and dark ice. They were named Iceborn. Those with this ability to withstand the worst of the numbing frost would be spared until the very end. However, Lysandra's sisters grew displeased. Avarosa argued that the only thing worse than death was servitude. Even Cyrilda bristled against what would become of the world they had fought so hard for. Caught in the middle, Lysandra tried to soothe her sister's concerns while appealing to the Watchers for more time, but the unknowable nothingness cared not for such platitudes. The void erupted into the mortal world in the far north. Lysandra now realized her mistake and sought the aid of the Yetis. Recall that Anivia granted the Heart of the Blue, which transformed them into magical beings and allowed them to make true ice. True ice is a magical ice that could only be created by the Yeti and the magic given to them by Anivia, a very rare mineral. It is so cold, it can never be melted. Lysandra allied with her sisters and the Yetis with their power of true ice to combat the Watchers. Amidst this catastrophic war, Lysandra stole the magic from the Yetis and sacrificed everyone, even her sisters, to imprison the Watchers in true ice at the bottom of the Howling Abyss. In the aftermath, true ice, the hollowed legacy of the Yetis, now stands as a bulwark against these void nightmares. But corruption spreads, and slowly this pure substance mixes with the void becoming dark ice, a sinister perversion of its once pure form. Today, only one Yeti remains to tell this story, Willem, who carved it into the walls of the once lively home of his people, and he, as the last Yeti, would be the sole protector of the heart of Anivia. Now, the Watchers wander through Lysandra's dreams as easily as she had theirs, and always she would wake, terrified, professing her loyalty to the chilling eternity they promised. Ever the survivor, she gathered her remaining followers to venerate her and her departed sisters. If true ice would delay the inevitable end of all things, then they had to gather as much of it as they could and scour the frozen lands for any of Iceborne descent to join their cause, even going as far as taking children from their villages and training them to become Frostguard soldiers in her army. Lysandra and the first among her Frostguard did everything in their power to rewrite history, seizing all records of what had truly happened. And yet, rumors and prophecies persisted in myth and song. It was whispered that Averos and Cerilda would one day return to unite the desperate tribes. And so Lysandra and the first among her Frostguard did everything in their power to rewrite history, seizing all records of what had truly happened. And yet, rumors and prophecies persisted in myth and song. 
It was whispered that Avarosa and Sroda would one day return to unite the desperate tribes, and Solisandra had any who were hailed as their reincarnations quietly killed. Even she retreated into the shadows, periodically renewing herself with the powers she had been gifted. Like the threat that lies trapped beneath the ice, Lysandra has never been able to completely control her sister's legends. Whether from guilt or arrogance, her failure to eradicate their legacy has manifested once more in two powerful Iceborne. One, an idealist, the other, a conqueror. And now between them they lead many tribes within the Fraljord. We know currently Ash is hailed as the reincarnation of Avarosa, and I'm pretty confident Sezwani would be the reincarnation of Cyrilda. I don't know if Lysandra is silencing them just to prevent the Fraljord from unifying against her, or if there actually is something to this reincarnation stuff. I think it's more that she does not want the Fraljord to unify against her since Ash does not believe in the reincarnation stuff, according to her lore. Although she does wield the bow of Avarosa, which radiates against her back and guides her decisions at times. Lysandra watches Ash and Sejuani carefully seeking any opportunity to pit them against one another, all the while redoubling her own efforts to lock away the terrible secrets she had buried deep beneath her own citadel. And she must hurry, for the ice is beginning to melt. It is now where the events of Song of Nunu take place, so if you don't want any spoilers, feel free to skip to the next timestamp. We mentioned already the Heart of the Blue, also known as the Heart of Anivia, which was given to the Yetis and gave them the power to make true ice. We know from Song of Nunu that Willump was the guardian of the Heart of the Blue after the War of the Three Sisters. Eventually, he meets Nunu, and he gives this power to Nunu. A piece of Anivia's heart. That's got to be the Heart of the Blue, right? We got to find out what happened to it. Hmm. There's no need to snap at me just because you can't remember. <laughs> What? What do you mean you had it? When? <laughs> so you were its guardian? Why didn't you say so? What did you do with it? Come on, Willem. I thought we were friends. I don't understand why you can't just tell me the truth. You do know that the Heart of the Blue is going to take me to my mom, right? So where is it, Willem? <laughs> where it belongs? What does that mean? More riddles? You're as bad as mom! Oh, you got to be kidding me! You're going to sleep now? <sighs> Fine. We'll talk in the morning. Where it belongs. And Lysandra, by the end of Song of Nunu, is aware that Nunu has the power of true ice, the power of the Yetis. Do you remember what the heart of the blue is? I don't know what it is. You never told me. A fire for the darkness. A candle for the night, but I don't know what that means. It means you need it to be somewhere dark before you could find it. You know where it is, Nunu. You feel it now. Don't you? No. I don't know. It can't be. Say it. Will gave me the heart of the blue? He did. So, where it belongs is with you, Nunu. But why? You'll have to ask Willem. I feel like I'll lose you if I touch it, Mom. Is that true? In a way, yes. Then I can't. I... I won't lose you again. You'll play my songs, I trust. You'll tell stories about me. Yes, but... Listen to me, Nunu. You cannot kill a story. You cannot kill a song. So long as there are voices to sing and ears to hear, a song lives forever. As will I, okay? Okay. But right now, you have a brother who needs your help. A brother? Willump! 
You know what you must do? I do. And are you ready? I am. Then let's go. I tell you, five armies, left arm, no problem. A new record for the mighty... Oh, uh, Brom is thinking this maybe is not best time for a union, huh? Survive first, big fluffy hugs later. Come, giant bottle, check. Little hero, check. Let's go, let's go, let's go. She now believes that Nunu is the savior of the Freljord, and that she must ready him for the war that is yet to come. Impossible. That boy. He... healed me. Granted, it only lasted for an instant. But for the first time in an age, I could... see. And what a sight it was. The power. The power that I have sought for so long. Wielded by a child. He has the Yeti magic. No. He is the Yeti magic. He is the heart of the blue. But how has this happened? Was it all our fault? In manipulating the Yetis, did I forge the need for this boy to exist? I was wrong about so many things. I am not the savior I thought I was. Such power. Such innocence. The boy is a blade. Not me, and certainly not the Yeti. Yes. I must sharpen that blade, for what is yet to come. The North shall have its frozen messiah. The savior to face the abyss. The hourglass runs short. No. The hourglass is broken. The time is now. I shall watch him. As they watch me. One thing that I will say when it comes to Song of Nunu. I love the game. I love what it does for the lore, especially with Nunu and Lissandra. My only gripe is I don't like that they fought at the bottom of the Howling Abyss with one of the Watchers looking like they were floating in a fish tank under their feet just watching. The Eye in the Abyss is one of my favorite short stories. I'll link right now to my hour long audio drama, although it was one of my earlier videos so my audio isn't as good, but the effort is still real. But I don't like that it lightens that story. I mean why is Lissandra sending Iceborne Frostguard down there, some of whom die on the trip? when she can just pop down there whenever she wants and have a full battle with no problem. That's the only part I hope they pull back on regarding Song of Nunu being canon. But all in all, it's an amazing game. If you have not played Song of Nunu, it's probably one of my favorite Riot Forge titles. Although they are so different, it's tough to compare. But I hope you enjoyed this video. Like and subscribe for more Runeterra lore, arcane updates, and Ride on Mo news. Overall, I love the story of Lissandra, Nunu, Willump, Avarosa, Anivia, the Heart of the Blue, the Watchers, the Demigods, it's all great. The Freljord is one of my favorite zones. 
I hope in the Rider Mo we see Nunu evolve into the hero of the Freljord. I hope he faces tough choices. Really what I'm trying to say is I kind of want to see Nunu get older. Not turn dark, but I kind of want to see him go through it if that makes sense and make some tough choices. He's one of my favorite characters in Terra because of how much potential I think he has. As for Lissandra, she did doom all of Runeterra, although she is now obsessed with holding off this darkness. She is most certainly going to play a role in the Ride of Mo as well, whether that be an expansion level raid boss or something more. Although in my video discussing zones coming at launch for the Ride of Mo, I do think that the Freljord will come later, and not one of the zones that will come at the launch of the game. Just because there's so much story there, I feel like it would take one expansion or more to flesh it all out. Thanks again for stopping by the Grove, and I will see you in the next one. I will bury the world in ice.